Aloha and happy St. Patrick's Day. Welcome back to another episode of A Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, where each week we examine how our science impacts our own lives, we explore why we all should care about science, and we discover more things to love about science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. As many of you know, I sometimes tell what I call science campfire stories, tales of unusual animals, plants, or scientists. Sometimes I just spend uh, a few moments talking about these. Today's show is sort of an odd example of how these science campfire stories come to be. My guest today, Rachel Wade, has spent the last several years studying a most unusual animal, an animal that actually captures and uses the energy from sunlight just as plants do. So in honor of St. Patrick's Day, Likeable Science is going green. Welcome to Likeable Science. Rachel, good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, well, I'm very excited you're here. and. Uh, Let's just start with just a little bit of background. Uh, you, you are a botanist, mm -hmm. but you're studying uh, a slug, which, as most of us biologists know, is not a plant. Right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this. Sure. So I am a phycologist by trade, so not psychologist, okay. but phycologist, which is someone who studies algae. Right. And I, uh, since my undergrad, I was always very interested in the interactions between invertebrates and marine animals and the algae they interact with every day. And it was actually the lab manager in my advisor, Dr. Allison Sherwood's lab, that noticed there was this slug that was very, very common in areas that were mostly dominated by an invasive alga. And we knew that not many things ate this inv invasive alga. Actually, we didn't know of anything that did. Mm -hmm. And so we were very curious, what is this slug eating? And what we, uh, when we started to look at the slug, we realized that it was bright green. And looking at it a little bit more, we realized that it belongs to the special group that, of slugs that once they feed on the algae, they sequester and basically enslave the chloroplast from the algae they eat. So just from these humble beginnings of curiosity in the field, um, my PhD was essentially born to look at the diversity of algae that we can find from those chloroplasts taken in by the slugs. Ah, so you... you pull the chloroplasts out of the slugs in some way, look at them and can tell what algae they came out of. And so you can tell, is it really eating all the invasive algae or is it Correct. selectively picking up other algae that are less common? Exactly. And bottom line is it is eating the invasive algae, at least to yes. some extent. Yes, so that's more of a, a more recent finding. Right. Um, for my master's, I looked at um, just the diversity and I, I remember I was very hesitant to get the results back because I thought they're probably eating one thing. They're eating the most abundant thing, which may be this invasive or may not be. And they were eating this huge diversity of algae, many of which were new to Hawaii. Huh. And so that was really, really exciting. But what we noticed from our preliminary results right away was that they were primarily eating these algae that are very small, so not the ones that are very abundant. Um, these ones that are very difficult to see just even with the trained eye to find in the field. And so um, we decided to do a little bit of a feeding study and see if there was a preference going on there. Our, our data suggested there might be. And um, so we, we did a nice little feeding study and what we found is that they are preferentially eating these really tiny, what we call cryptic, so very difficult to ID with just looking at the algae um, species. Yeah. And again, that, um, many of which were new to Hawaii or um, putative new species. Uh -huh. so, so we have a picture here of the, of the slug. Right, so okay. what you'll notice, you see a kind of slit down the back of the slug. Mm -hmm. And this is due to parapodia um, it, that's basically just flaps <laughs> that these slugs have evolved. And these are very, very important. So um, it's been shown that these parapodia evolved and have allowed um, the long-term sequestration and retention of these chloroplasts. So for example, there are other species of slugs that, that do this, we call it kleptoplasty or right. stealing plastids, right. but they may only hold on to their chloroplasts for a few days and they don't have these nice flaps to cover those sequestered chloroplasts. But slugs like Placobrinchus, which is what I study and pictured here, right are able to basically fold themselves up like a taco. Okay. And by doing that, they're behaviorally shading their chloroplasts, protecting oh. them from too much exposure to the light, which then lengthens the time that they can keep them photosynthetic, okay. which means they'll keep making sugar and food for the slug longer. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, this is an intriguing phenomenon, right? Uh, because the slug gets these chloroplasts by eating the algae, mm -hmm. right? And somehow then in its digestive system, it doesn't degrade the, the chloroplast. Right. It degrades a bunch of other things, the, the cells, the algal cells of the chloroplasts that are right. in, but somehow then allows 
or transports the, the chloroplast out to its own skin, right? Right. And so to specific parts of its skin? Yes, it is very specific parts actually of its digestive system that are stored more superficially on the on the back oh. surface of the slug. Um, so these slugs only feed on what we call siphonous algae. Um, what I mean by that is even though they can grow to be a meter in length, they are a single cell, okay. which makes it very easy for digestion. So these slugs use a single tooth to pierce the cell wall, and then they have what's called a radula, which is essentially a, um, a straw that they use to suck out the cellular contents. And then from there, they have special little um, extensions of their gut, kind of like our lungs that take up oxygen, that engulf the chloroplasts and then filter them into these special extensions of their digestive system. Okay. It is very sophisticated. Because uh -huh. then they must use the rest of the cellular, the cytoplasm and all that, that, to get the en other yes. energy they want. But, but yes. they're, they're being very efficient about the whole thing. It's very efficient, oh, oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> Very, very intriguing because uh, particularly in light of the, the new the biotech people who are now all working on uh, getting sort of artificial photosynthesis going. Right. You know, you know the, the, the slugs figured it out uh, how to how to co op the plant. Exactly. Very, very, very neat. So these uh, algae are, are single celled algae, even though they make the algae, each cell may be actually very, very large. Correct. And but so that the slugs in general are, are eating very, I mean, small bits of algae, because of course their mouths are actually tiny, right? Exactly. Right, so they can't, they're not going to chew off a big uh, filamentous thing. So are they having impacts, do you think, on the invasive algae? Are they keeping it down? Are they, are they hitting the small ones before they can grow big? So that was something when I first began this project and looking at the environment they were in and seeing that they were in um, habitats that were very much overtaken by this invasive alga, we, we wondered whether or not they were making an impact. But there was actually a study done not too many years ago in um, the British Isles where there's a sister species of slug and, and an invasive alga. And what they found is that the slug preferentially fed on that invasive alga and was able to control its populations. Mm -hmm. So if we take a look at that other picture I gave you, um, we can see our invasive alga in action. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is that it's doing a really good job of invading. So all of those <laughs> large mounds, greenish brown mounds, are the invasive alga. This is Monolua Bay on the south shore near Hawaii Kai. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's really, really good at what it does. Um, the slug is the only thing we know that eats it. And so in this environment, the slug's not having a huge impact. Okay. However, it may be doing uh, th just that in environments that are newly invaded. And oh. that's something I'm hoping to look at a little bit more with the next chapter of my oh. dissertation. Yeah, okay, well, very, very intriguing, that this uh, unusual interaction. Um, and is much known about sort of the mechanism? I mean, you say it's uh, the, the chloroplasts stay in these branches of the digestive system, but, but they are just sort of moved along somehow while, mm -hmm. while other material is not. But I don't think that's well understood. There uh -huh. have been some really great physiological studies, right. but understanding how it's not being digested and it's being maintained, my guess is there's some sophisticated um, communication going on between the host cells and the algal cells that are not yet identified. Right, because yes, how, how is it differentiating between the chloroplast and the nucleus or the chloroplast and uh, ends up a exactly. reticulum or a, a lysosome or whatever other bit piece organelle of the cell may be. And it, somehow it's recognizing and, and selectively treating the chloroplast differently. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's uh, an amazing accomplishment. Um, well, that, that's, that's wonderful to learn about. And it, it seems like it's a, uh, an animal that, w that tells us some interesting uh, sort of, sort, uh, stories, right? Right, yeah. So that was one thing we did not expect. We did not expect to be able to essentially use this slug as a sampling tool to look at diversity that was otherwise invisible for the most part. It's not, these, these algae are not easy to go out and find, these very small, what we usually refer to them as, as diminutive. Okay. Um, we didn't expect to have the opportunity to learn so much more about this invasive alga than we knew before. Um, so it's been really fun to be able to look at an animal and learn about algae. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is not really right. necessarily what most people would expect. Right, the slug is sort of doing the sampling for you in, in exactly. a way, and, and sampling at a, at a scale that you can't really do very very easily, certainly. Exactly. I, mean, you, I guess you could pick up the rocks and take them back in the lab and 
You can, but they're so right. small. A lot of times they just kind of look like little green fingers right. coming out of the rock, yeah, so it, very difficult to identify. Right. But the chloroplasts in each species of algae are subtly different in some way that you can so tell? We, we use molecular techniques. So okay. we are able to extract the DNA from the chloroplast and use chloroplast-specific genetic markers okay. to right. identify which species they originated right. from. So this is very, very interesting, a one-off, right? Because the chloroplasts have their own DNA. Correct. But each type of chloroplast belongs to a specific type of algae that you can then associate the one type of DNA with the other. Right. Yeah, very, very, very neat. Very, <laughs> very sophisticated uh, uh, feeding habit, as it were. And of course, this is really good to know because we want to know what's happening with these invasive al alga, algae. Uh, we want to know if the, uh, is the situation getting worse. We sort of think right. it is, right? In, in a crude way. Yeah, so, um, the Department of Aquatic Resources is working very hard to track the spread of this alga and um, doing continuous surveying and things like that. But um, my preliminary research and some other research that was done in the early 2000s found that this alga is not always that big, robust, dark green mass that you saw in the picture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be very small and cryptic, just like these other taxa and species of algae I've been talking about. And so what's really helpful, again, with this slug is because it preferentially feeds on these very small cryptic things, it can be a more selective tool for tracking this alga. The only unfortunate thing is that this doesn't seem to be the first choice for the slug. Uh -huh. This may be a last ditch effort of, of food huh. if there aren't other things available. Oh, I see, I see. So that's what you said, you did, you did a food preference test. Right. So I, I, having done some animal training myself and all, uh, tell me a little bit about how, how, do you, how do you do it? How do you determine what, what food a slug likes? Yeah, so what we did first is we developed a sampling technique to be able to look at the diversity from the field, from the slug, without killing it. Okay. So we basically um, made it really happy by putting some alcohol into a, a dish with it. The slug relaxed a little bit, as we all do with a little alcohol. Sure. And then um, we just very gently pinched off uh, the very superficial layers of their back, which allowed us to sample some of those chloroplasts. Mm -hmm. So um, once we did that, we starved them for 75 days under pretty high light. And what that did was, um, it allowed the slug to clear some of that older chloroplast material out, but also the high light broke down the chloroplast for us a little bit. Uh -huh. So once they were no longer green, okay. then we put them in a feeding study. And so what we did for the feeding study is we gave them a lot of those really abundant, large taxa that we had first thought they would like. Okay. And then we gave them what we call live rock, which are these small pieces of rock that have a whole community of algae growing on them, and much of which are these little finger-like diminutive taxa. And so um, what we found was that the slugs that had the nice, big, abundant species didn't feed at all, hmm. and the ones that had the live rock um, were very happy and fed a lot and became green, um, became photosynthetic. We can measure that. We can measure the photosynthetic activity. Um, and we got a molecular or genetic signal from those chloroplasts that we then sampled again. Oh, okay. And that's, then you could, you could tell how, many, how many, much of one species versus another. Right. Yeah, exactly. Very, very clever. It's, it's, uh, it, is, it is fun working with animals. And, and, and they're very charismatic. It right. doesn't help right. that they're very cute. <laughs> Now you see, not I expect not everyone would say that, but yes, I have heard. <laughs> I have gotten some strange looks. I'm sure when you tell people you work with slugs, people are like, "Ooh!" Yeah, they think the brown slimy things right. in their garden. Right. Absolutely, right. Yeah. not the cute little things with purple horns right. and right. blue dots. <laughs> and, and about how big are these slugs? They are about two inches long for the most part. Oh, okay. Yes, but they are very sand colored, so it can be difficult to find them in the mm -hmm. field. But they're they're fairly cosmopolitan around Oahu. Um, they're at Waikiki, they're, um, they're in Mauna Loa Bay, as I mentioned, they're up in Kaneohe Bay, huh. so they're quite, they're around. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're, we're going to look into these slugs and the algae a little bit more here in the second part of the show, but right now we have to take a break. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. Rachel Wade from the U UH Department of Botany is with me today. And we'll I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Pete McGinnis-Mark to talk about HIGP and research in Manoa. What about that show, Pete? I think it's great, Jay. Research at Manoa really provides faculty members at the University of Hawaii with an easy way of explaining some of the research activities we're conducting on the campus. 
For example, I do a lot of space research, whether it's the Moon and Mars, but many of my other colleagues do other interesting kinds of work, whether it's exploring the ocean floor in submarines, studying earthquakes and tsunamis, or other activities. So research at Manoa really provides us with a way of telling the general public some of the activities which we're involved in, as well as communicating to our colleagues and students. This is a fun science, and we really appreciate the activities which research at Manoa enable us to talk about. I love research at Manoa. Come around, join us. It's Monday, 1 o'clock p.m., every single Monday. Be there or be square. <laughs> And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Rachel Wade from the UH Department of Botany. We are talking about uh, an amazing sea slug, whose name I won't even try to pronounce. <laughs> but it's Placobranchus. Placobranchus, yes. yes, okay. Uh, and <coughs> what's fascinating, one of the many fascinating things, I guess I should say, about this slug is, is that it consumes algae and then co-opts their chloroplasts and uses them and lets them, as the picture shows, turns green mm -hmm. and, and captures sunlight and basically uses the, the sugars, I guess, that the chloroplasts produce and, and, and uh, those stay in the digestive system and, and get used for the, the slug's own growth. Right. And, and the chloroplast lasts for a while and all. Yeah, so that's one of the most interesting things about Placobranchus is that it is the second longest retainer of chloroplast. So it can keep its chloroplast happy and photosynthesizing for up to 13 months. Wow. So that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah. long time to keep it going. There's one other species, a sister species, Alicia chlorotica, that can do it just a little bit longer. But oh. it's pretty amazing, which actually is pretty... Oh. Um, a hot topic right now is people are interested in, well, how does it do this? Right. How is it keeping an organelle that normally relies on a nucleus right. to tell it what to do? How is the slug doing that? And so there have been quite a few studies looking at what is called horizontal gene transfer. And the idea is if the slug can keep those chloroplasts happy, then maybe they have taken some of the genes from the algal nucleus uh -huh. and co-opted those to continue controlling okay. the chloroplast. However, no one has found any real conclusive um, evidence of that mm. yet. So we're still wondering, how yeah. are they doing this? Right, but, but obviously the slug is creating an environment, at least, that is similar enough to the algal environment that the chloroplast is reasonably happy. Right. And that's, I mean, that, that's really amazing. That that's, has implication for organ transplant and all. Uh, if, if, you know, we can start putting pig livers into people or whatever, whatever you may, may want to do. I mean, this, that figuring this uh, clever trick on, on the slugs part out would be a, right. a very worthwhile thing to do. Right, so, and this, this is something that happens in other organisms, but with whole whole organism. So we, we think about coral. Coral is something most people in Hawaii know about. Right. So coral have a symbiotic alga, um, symbiodinium. And, but the difference is, is that's an entire alga, whereas this is just a chloroplast. Mm -hmm. But there has been some really interesting work done showing that the coral um, has some genes that the symbiodinium needs and vice versa. So they have this very, very close-knit relationship. Mm -hmm. It must be the same in the slug. We just haven't been able to figure that out yet. But you're right, it has all sorts of implications to understanding symbiotic relationships mm -hmm. and <laughs> enslavement <laughs> of other <laughs> organisms. And it, I mean, it really, it, it really it speaks to the, uh, uh, yeah, as you say, the close-knit relationship. So, I mean, can these slugs live without these algae? So that's a good question. So the, I think they could live without the kleptoplasty. Okay. Um, there was some work done a few years ago that showed that Placobranchus in particular is constantly overturning its sequestered chloroplast. So it doesn't eat once and hold on to those chloroplasts. Once it eats again, it will um, somehow selectively move out those older chloroplasts and replace them with newer ones. Mm -hmm. So they always have a fresh supply of photosynthesizing chloroplasts. Um, so that to me means that they're not getting a lot of regular nutrition necessarily from the chloroplast. The, the cytoplasm itself is probably supplying a lot of its necessary nutrition. Yeah. Um, but why not? Why right. not have a store on your back at all times right. for extreme environments? Yeah, exactly. It, 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 and it, it can't be too sort of biochemically expensive for them to do this, although it seems like a very complicated process to us, but obviously they've figured out some efficient solution, so it, it, right. pay, it pays them off, obviously, to do it. Right. But that's, 
But so if they want, and again, this brings up a whole other thing. If they are turning over these chloroplasts, they then have a mechanism to select. They know which chloroplasts are older, right. presumably because they are maybe being less efficient, putting out less sugars or whatever. But but they have a mechanism to, to process those independently, as it were. Right. Wow. Wow. Just I mean, you, you <laughs> see the complexities of this. this is exactly. A, a great a great example of how life forms interweave and inter, inter, uh, intertwine with one another. The, exactly. The classic uh, uh, orchids and the pollinators of specific species of orchids where the, right. the, the birds' bills have adapted to exactly the flower shape or vice, and or vice versa, right? So I would say that analogy is definitely applicable to this system. Mm -hmm. They have developed this sharp tooth mm -hmm. and then the straw-like radula to be able to suck out the cytoplasm. I mean, this is a very, very good example of coevolution. Mm -hmm. Um, just like birds and butterflies and things like that with plants. The other interesting thing about this slug is not only is it enslaving the chloroplasts, but it is also using the secondary um, and defensive chemicals that are produced by the alga to defend itself. So oh, there has wow. been some great chemistry work done to show that Placobranchus and other um, slugs like Placobranchus that do kleptoplasty also are stealing those chemicals and making it so they're not tasty anymore. Okay, yeah, I mean, again, some animals are the uh, uh, monarch butterflies are the classic example, right? right? They eat milkweed, which itself is toxic, and they borrow exactly. those toxins to make themselves toxic. Yeah, okay, but I, no, I hadn't, I hadn't realized these slugs are, are playing. So again, there's a whole second chemical pathway going on there. Right. And that's got to be processed rather separately, right. presumably, because that those toxins have to be kept more or less away from it, the rest of it. Right. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that work and how what the mechanism of that would be, but they're doing it. <laughs> no, but but this this is a you know really very pretty picture in a, in a sense of you take research which looks like it should just be it's what some people would say obscure and some people probably would say why are you doing it it seems worthless and yet here it has all these implications and applications potentially to organ transplant to immunology right. to toxicology. Coevolution, yeah, co-speciation. Co exactly, exactly. That, that's just, that's a, it's beautiful how sort of everything you're discovering about this is sort of opening up. I mean, it's, it's a classic, you know, you, one good question right. opens up a dozen more good questions, right? Right, which was unexpected. I thought this was going to be a neat little master's, and then <laughs> I just had all of these questions, and it developed into a whole dissertation. Yeah, I, I, I hear you on that. I had, uh, when I first went into graduate school, I got there at the start of a summer and mm -hmm. really didn't have classes or things till the fall, so I was just got engaged in a little get your hands wet kind of project just to keep me busy that first summer. And six years later, I had completed a third of that project <laughs> <laughs> for my dissertation. So it, yeah, I know how layers upon layers upon layers of complexity actually uh, unravel in, right. in, in uh, research. So, so where, where do you expect to take this? Or do, do you not know? Um, so. I have always liked the chemistry component of this, mm -hmm. so um, after finishing my dissertation, I would love the opportunity to look more at this relationship of co-opting the anti-herbivore compounds. I think mm -hmm. that's a really fascinating story. Um, the next chapter of my dissertation is is looking if we can if we can use this as a gateway to tr to track Avernvillia, that very very invasive species. If people are not familiar with it, um, it's commonly known as leather mudweed. Um, it, like I said, it's really good at being in invasive, but um, it's also really good at changing the benthic habitat, and that's really a problem here where we have things like corals who live on the hard substrate on the bottom. So this alga has a root-like system that can hold on to sediment and as a result it can smother corals. Mm -hmm. So it can have a very dire effect on our coral reefs and the health of our coral reefs. Mm -hmm. So if we can use this as a gateway to understand that alga more and manage it mm -hmm. better, that's the direction I would really like to sure, see this sure. go. Can we can we train the, the sea turtles to eat the algae? <laughs> they actually, you know, the sea turtles do a pretty good job with some of our other invasive huh. species, okay. just not this one. Um, they don't find it tasty, huh? No. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, the slug is the only documented right. herbivore of this plant. Uh, it has been seen a fish will take a bite of Avernvillia, but then they promptly spit it out. It really <laughs> doesn't taste good. It, um, this alga has whole chemicals named after it because uh -huh. they're so nasty. Uh -huh. well, that's, I mean, that's the, that's the, the never-ending game in evolution, right, is for the... the 
plants to try to make themselves right. as unappealing to their potential consumers and the consumers to try to make their digestive systems and mouth parts as robust right so they can they can deal with all that yeah yeah this alga really has all of the boxes checked for what to do to be really successful especially in a, a new environment yeah that's that's uh, that's what it takes to get by in a in a, in a, in a ever-changing competitive world right right and, and speaking of sort of preparing for an ever-changing world. So given your experiences and, and what you've gone through here, what would you say to students just sort of considering a career in science? What kind of advice would you give them? That's a really great, great question. So I, I teach 101 students right now. So mm -hmm. students who maybe are not interested in science and mm -hmm. this is maybe the only science class they take. And the big thing I try to emphasize is that anyone can do science. All right. Science comes off as this big scary thing that only really, really smart people can do and thats it's just not true. Anybody can do science, you just have to be interested and want to do it. Um, and I would say right now in our world with climate change and everything that we are facing, uh, we need scientists and we need that next generation with new bold ideas to keep pushing. So it may not be the most lucrative career, but I would say it's very satisfying. It is, it is. It's, it is endless. The questions are always there. The questions are always, new questions are always emerging. Somebody right. finds something in one field and that suddenly opens up a whole new set of questions in another field. And yeah, it, it's, that's truly the intriguing thing about science uh, and what keeps, I think, scientists coming back from back for more, as it were. Right. So that's, <laughs> I, I think you, you hit it there. And the, the need for perseverance is great to get just through the, the science training, certainly. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the issues at graduate school yes. pl places in front of you is, do you really care enough to <laughs> come into the lab day in and day out? And Can you keep pushing right, for four, five, six right. years or more? Right, yeah. Um, but it, it's, it, uh, it, it is, uh, as you say, it, uh, it, it is an intriguing uh, area of study. So, Well, excellent. Uh, this, this has been most fascinating to, to learn as I do every, every week on the show, I learn new things and I've learned a ton from you here this week. Great. So uh, I, I hope at some point, uh, I wish you of course the best of luck with finishing things up and, Thank I, you. and, and taking this off into exciting new directions wherever they may lead. Thank you so much for coming on here on St. Patrick's Day and, and en enlightening and ingreening, I guess, our show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. And I hope uh, viewers will join us again next week for another episode of A Likeable Science. <laughs>